Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this tablet webinar. Um, tonight we will be discussing a synodal church needs accountability and our host for this evening will be our very own uh, tablets Rome correspondent Christopher Lamb. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Christopher. If you do have any questions to ask any of our panel, if you could please direct them to myself, Amanda, um, uh, through the chat box, then I can feed them through um, as the panel are talking and Christopher will feed them through. Um, very many thanks for joining us this evening. Um, over to you, Christopher. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone uh, for this webinar. Um, delighted to have so many people on, on the call and hopefully have uh, uh, other viewers uh, on other channels later on, on YouTube, uh, etc. Um, it's, I think, a very important discussion that we're going to have uh, this evening on the question of accountability uh, in a more synodal church and what that looks like. Um, the question of accountability has come up time and again in the synodal dialogue so far and is also mentioned a number of times in the working document for the Synod Assembly, which is fast approaching uh, next month. So I'm delighted this evening to be joined by four experts to discuss this topic of accountability in the church, three of whom are participating in the Synod uh, in different ways. Now, I must also give the context to this seminar, this uh, webinar, um, which is very much in partnership with something called the Peter and Paul Seminar, which is a, uh, get a basically a gathering of theologians and canon lawyers who examine questions of church reform. And in April 2022, the Peter and Paul Seminar met in Quebec and discussed the question of accountability. And from that, uh, the papers that were presented were then published in the studio, Studia Canonica, a academic journal, and I'm going to put the link to that journal in the chat box now. So if people are interested in purchasing or reading further um, and um, going to the reading the papers from that, they can uh, do so. So if Amanda could put that in the, the chat box, I'd be very grateful, the link to it. Um, so this evening we have, um, as I said, four experts, uh, mm -hmm. Two of the hosts or the, the, the moderators of the Peter and Paul seminar, um, Father Eugene Duffy, um, who is joining us to uh, for, the, for this discussion. Father Eugene is a lecturer in theology at Mary Immaculate College, University of Limerick and All, Hallow College, All Hallows College, Dublin. Uh, we have Miriam Vylands, who is uh, the co-moderator of the Peter and Paul seminar, a professor of canon law uh, in the Faculty of Theology at University of Erfurt and has been very involved in the Synod on Synodality and will be an expert at the Synod uh, in the Vatican next month. We also have uh, Rafael Luciani, a Professor of Theology at the Universidad Católica in Caracas in Venezuela, also Professor at Aust Boston College and is uh, an expert uh, advisor at the forthcoming Synod and has been very involved in uh, helping the Synod office in Rome with the organization of the uh, Synod process. And finally, Father Vimal Tirumana, I think a number of tablet uh, readers will know of him. Uh, he's a lecturer in moral theology at the Alfon Alfonsianum in Rome and in the National Seminary in Sri Lanka. Uh, he is also been involved in advising the Synod uh, through the Theological Commission as a member of that, and he is a voting member uh, of the Synod. So he's he's not just an advisor, he's actually going to be voting in the Synod uh, next month. And I should also add that in the Studio Canonica, which collects the papers which looked at the accountability question, um, seven of those who contributed are involved in the Synod, including Timothy Radcliffe, who's written the paper, and Timothy Radcliffe, of course, former master of the Dominicans, who will be leading the retreat for the Synod Assembly um, before uh, it begins on the 4th of October. So 
very warm welcome to all of our panelists thank you very much for for being part of it and for uh, spending some time this evening to discuss uh, what you have been uh, studying and researching um, and I, I'd like to start um, with with Miriam Miriam Violence who in your paper you write about how the clerical sexual abuse scandals really underline the urgent need for greater accountability uh, amongst church leaders and for structural changes to be made uh, to ensure this happens so what structural train changes do you see as necessary for a more synodal church and what role must women play in that well first of all thank you christopher for the invitation uh, to the whole peter and paul seminar to present our results we have been working since 2019 on the subject um, so we were very early to begin this project and um, we are very happy, um, I can say this on behalf of everybody, uh, all the members who participated, that our subject turned out to be so timely and that we were able to publish this in time. We, we really took up this project, so this group of theologians and canon lawyers, it's already a unique group because it doesn't exist anywhere in the world that they work together, but we have been doing this since 1998. We took up the project of accountability in a synodal church for two reasons. First, the sexual abuse crisis revealed that there was and is, it's not only in the past, is not only abuse of minors, but that there was and is also a major problem with the handling of allegations of abuse by bishops and others in leadership positions. Now, because of the inadequacy of the response by bishops to allegations, Pope Francis had already issued norms to hold them accountable in 2016 for not acting properly. Yet in 2018, I think we all remember, there was the major crisis of the church in Chile, and then the Pope decided that um, there should be a meeting in the Vatican with the presidents of the Episcopal Conferences. And that meeting in February 2019 had as teams responsibility, accountability, and transparency. I believe that the word and notion of accountability really entered the ecclesial domain there in that meeting. As a side mark, the word accountability does not exist in Italian. And I think we have to reflect what that means because the church so much operates from an Italian perspective. Yet that conference of 2019 was faced with a problem. Sure, bishops might have felt to be accountable to God and maybe to the Pope, but could they be held accountable to the other members of the people of God? And this was a very important question. And there was a remarkable intervention by the Undersecretary of the Dicastery for Laity and Family, Dr. Linda Kizoni, so a woman. And she's an excellent theologian and canon lawyer, and she explained with the help of the church understood as communio, how bishops are indeed part of the people of God. So we should use the language, the bishops and the other members of the people of God. No, not the bishops and the people of God, the bishops and the other members of the people of God. And she was able to, ex to begin a conversation explaining that they are held um, accountable to the people of God. She presented how this would not diminish the power of the bishops, but by making use of the talents and the gifts within the community, such an accountability and participation in exercising the responsibility that each and every member in the body of Christ has would in fact strengthen the bishop in his ministry. Now the Peter and Paul seminar decided to take up this question of accountability theologically and to see to possible canonical provisions. A second reason for addressing this topic was the announcement by Pope Francis to celebrate a synod on synodality. So soon, let's say the buzzword that you could hear everywhere was the call to listen. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, which requires to listen to all, because all have something to say. The Peter and Paul seminar was composed of these theologians and canon lawyers from really different parts of the world and with different expertise reflected on this and felt that if this would be understood as a mere listening in the sense of a mere consultation, canon law provides for 
a number of bodies that have to be consulted. But if the bishop then afterwards, nevertheless, makes his own decision and does his own thing, we, would, we said this could lead to a tremendous frustration in the people of God. So we felt that it would be necessary to discover how a mere consultation is being transformed in a true listening that becomes a transformative experience leading to consensus on what our faith in Christ calls us to be and to do here and now in our circumstances. So it's, it's always also contextual. Mm -hmm. So what is really required, and I say this as a canon lawyer, is not just structures for consultation and discernment, but an internal disposition. It's a true conversion um, to not only confess, but also act and believe that the Holy Spirit works in each and every one. Once such a conversion has occurred, there is no fear and indeed an internal space for accountability. Such a consultation requires a transparency and in such a process, when all can exercise the responsibility they carry in virtue of their role, their function and position, the credibility of the church in its missionary task will improve. And this is what lies behind the Synodal Church. So our projects attended to these questions and we discovered, to put it in a nutshell, synodality implies accountability. So listening alone is not sufficient. You have to, 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 to do this back and forth. Actually, what we did in the Senate in the past year, this back and forth between local and universal. Is this what you really meant? Is this what you really are saying? And accountability at the same time requires a synodal church. So, as I said at the beginning, when we began our project in 2020, we could not have imagined that the research project would just have, um, would just address such a major team uh, yeah. of the synod. But really, the sense of the faithful from around the world brought this to the fore. So, um, can I just uh, ask you, though, about the whole question of the, the, where we are with the accountability of bishops? at the moment because it does seem a bit of a murky process about when a bishop might be removed from office how a bishop is held accountable and we've just had the findings in switzerland um another report showing failures when it comes to abuse and failures from bishops in dealing with it where do you think we are with that why why is it seen does it still seem so murky um and what do you think needs to happen to make this system more accountable when it comes to bishops who who may need to be uh, removed from office because of failures well i think uh, it's, it's quite remarkable that now in switzerland after a rather short time the holy see has decided to um, have an, uh, a visitation and to have an investigation of what really went on and what happened there and I think in, in earlier times, there was a much greater reluctance. So we see that, you know, we are stepping up and um, uh, we can also see in different countries around the world, bishops have lost their offices in Poland, in Ireland, in Chile. Um, you know, it's all over the world that bishops are um, asked to take their responsibility. And then um, and often is the case that uh, canon law, can, can the Pope re remove a bishop? Well, yes, the Pope could remove a bishop. But I think it's always better when the bishop himself acknowledges that he made the mistakes and then offers a resignation and thus indeed take responsibility for um, the mistake that he has made. I personally also think that we have to differentiate between bishops who made mistake between before 2001, when there was no um, obligatory reporting in sexual abuse cases um, to the Holy See um, when it comes to minors and the norms that were issued afterwards. So um, I've been myself involved in many of these abuse cases. I was an investigating judge in more than 100 cases mandated by bishops to do this. And I just had to, to see over all these years, I've been doing this since 2001. Um, I really saw that oftentimes it was not a surprise when a report again was um, coming to the fore, um, the archives would speak a, a different language. So I think, but we are moving. My question, also having worked in different, uh, different countries is, 
how is it possible that bishops in the same cultural context, France, Germany, Switzerland, that they do not learn from each other? Why is there no learning process? Why, did, why have bishops a hard time speaking about this and sharing their experience, listening to the Irish bishops, listening to some American bishops, um, Chile bishops, Polish bishops? How come they are not able to learn? I think we really need to attend to that. Okay, well, thank you. And um, I, I'd now like to ask uh, Raffaello Gianni about, about his contribution to this discussion. And I was struck listening to to um, Miriam who's saying that accountability, the phrase is, or the word doesn't really exist in Italian, but yet accountability is a, an ancient concept. It goes right back to uh, ancient ancient Egypt. Um, and it's, it's not something that's a, a new idea. And in, and in your paper, Raphael, you, you show how uh, the, the, the theological, uh, how accountability is theologically imagined. And you talk about how the church hierarchy cannot be seen in isolation from the people of God. Um, yet we do see this disconnect, don't we? Um, can you explain how the church in Latin America in particular has found ways to tackle this, this disconnect and has found ways to, to bring in accountability into church structures? Yeah, thank you so much, Chris, and all the people that are uh, watching and participating. Uh, I think that in Latin America, uh, we have uh, two key concepts that uh, has helped you know, to build a, a system where uh, today we can move forward towards accountability. And the first is a notion of self-binding. And um, in, usually we ask of the bishops uh, to have a norm or a procedure established, for example, in the removal of bishops. In Latin America, we have this self-binding character. And to put an example, in a recent reform of a diocese, my diocese of La Guaira, the bishop can be removed by the pastoral councils, but it's a network of pastoral councils. So this self-binding concept that comes before the Vatican II in Latin America and has been developing through Salam uh, is important. No? And the other uh, thing that has shaped uh, is the local church's ecclesiology that started before the council. Uh, we have to remember that before the council, Latin America already had more than 10 continental ecclesial networks. And then Salam was created in 1955. And this gave a sense of a collegial pastoral solidarity of a self-binding again a way of proceeding. And it's interesting because uh, we celebrate every eight to 12 years, more or less, uh, general Episcopal conferences from Medellin, Puebla, or Aparecida, for example, the Pope's uh, a conference. And this conference, they don't have a explicit a theological status. So the self-binding of the bishops to what they have there listened and decided is the, uh, what gives the character to those, uh, to those conference. And this is very interesting because those conference shape the whole option of the bishops uh, conference in Latin America. We're talking of 22. And um, Latin America is not only South or Central America, it includes also the Caribbean. So Salam uh, has a, a cultural uh, diversity and a linguistic diversity. So I think at the first, um, to respond, a, a first point is uh, we cannot understand accountability in Latin America without this self-binding and ecclesial network working concept before the council. But there was a breaking point and it's between 1979 and 1985 during John Paul II when we uh, convoke Puebla the third Latin American Episcopal General Episcopal Conference and the Synod Extraordinary in Rome. Between those years, uh, the local church's ecclesiology was lost. And for the first time in our continent, bishops were appointed without dioceses. And this change um, is interesting because in the case of Chile, where the crisis exploded first, 
is the country that was more intervened by Rome changing bishops. In fact, the whole face of a church that was the most progressive church during the council towards becoming the most conservative church around the 79th and, and onwards is interesting because today the problem that the Chilean bishops have is precisely how to change again the, the face of a church that lost credibility because bishops were disconnected for so many years uh, of this local uh, church's ecclesiology, you know. Uh, the word accountability doesn't exist neither in, in Spanish, but it doesn't create a problem. We use parallel uh, phrases, so, so a response, uh, institutional responsibility, for example, uh, rendering um, responsibility uh, to the community. So there are kind of ways, and because uh, there was an institution recently created in the 90s called CEPROME, it's a center for the protection of minors, and they have been uh, networking uh, using SELAM and also the Confederation of Religious Men and Women to create this consciousness that there is a problem of accountability in the church and they offer training. So this is something that is uh, new for us. It has helped uh, to have this consciousness and especially to have counseling uh, in how to build uh, in local churches and in congregations, is in religious orders, uh, an accountable procedure, an accountable safeguarding um, uh, the status, uh, and all of these that today is needed. No? Yeah, and, and just going back to what you said at the beginning about um, the example where pastoral councils can um, call on a bishop to step down, how, how does that work in practice? I mean, doesn't Rome have to give the final say on this? Well, it was a work of over two years. Uh, and this is interesting because the, the uh, accountable and the, the network of councils was done with a two-year consultation process with the communities. So it, did, it was not born by the bishop in the pastoral council on the, from the top to the bottom. After two years, the uh, creation of a network of pastoral councils, starting from ecclesial-based communities, then regional uh, commun pastoral councils, then parish pastoral councils, then uh, ter more territorial, including several parishes, pastoral councils, and then the pastoral diocesan council. In the network, you have uh, procedures and uh, it permits, allows to evaluate the bishops. So for example, in each pastoral council, at every level, you have to have a lay person and a priest as co-coordinators of the councils. And these people are elected by the community, not by the bishop. And then this uh, network of councils are represented in the diocesan pastoral council. And the removal of a priest in a parish of, of the bishop also in the diocese, it's, it's a self-binding process approved in the pastoral pa plan. Right. So it, it's not uh, mandated, as we know, uh, by canon law, but it's a self-binding, again, culture uh, that it's a kind of the way in which it, it, we proceed no that doesn't mean that everybody uh, does this in all the dioceses this is just one experience and uh, which, and diocese kind of, it, which diocese is it again did, did you say it? yeah it's called la guaira it's the diocese uh, near to caracas um, and it's a diocese uh, led right now by a salation bishop but the interesting thing is that it was a diocese of the opus day before so the, it implied a conversion, not only of the structures, but a work of over six years of the bishop creating the proper ambience to do then the process of consultation and the change. So it's not a one year thing or a decision of a, a bishop. It has been a process, very interesting one, of changing mentalities as well as creating structures. And how do you spell that? L-A, La. L -A, and then yep. Guaira, G-U-A-I-R-A, 
Guaira okay. and, and there is the, the website uh, with all the information. Okay, well, that's, that's really a really interesting um, example. So th 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 thank you for that. And um, I, I would like to now uh, bring in uh, Vimal, Vimal Tirumana, um, and, and ask you, Vimal, about what you talk about in your paper, which is the problem of clericalism, um, which is repeatedly identified in the synod process as, as one of the root causes of, of the abuses of power in the church. And you've written about how it's it comes about often through a distorted understanding of obedience um, that has fueled the, uh, the problem of clericalism. So how can a synodal church tackle this, this problem? Yes, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to also express my gratitude for giving me this privilege to participate in this seminar. Um, to begin with, uh, I would start with your first line that it is a concern of the whole church. What I mean is not just this church in, on this continent, that local church in that continent. It's a concern, clericalism as such, although this theme here is account accountability. I would like to start with what you said, namely, it is a concern of the entire universal church. And Miriam and Raphael, both of them were with me last year around this time, a little later than this time, September, when we met at, at Frascati, close to Rome, to go through the responses to the questionnaire from the parishes and dioceses from all over the world as the Episcopal conferences sent them. And both Miriam and um, Raphael will vouch for it, how each and every country, every local church Episcopal conference mentioned this as an issue. So I want to just affirm what you uh, said first, Chris. And also just two lines, permit me to read them uh, from the document that was produced from the responses to that questionnaire. It says this, that itself sums up what is at stake. It says clericalism is seen as a form of spiritual em impoverishment, a deprivation of the true goods of ordained ministry and a culture that isolates clergy and harms the laity. This culture separates us from the living experience of God and damages the kinship relationships of the baptized and damages, yes, I said that, uh, kinship relationships of the baptized, producing rigidity, attachment to legalistic power, and an exercise of authority that is power rather than service. I deliberately read that uh, because, as we know, before coming to my team proper in the uh, in the on, in the paper that I presented, uh, I want to say how clericalism is connected to accountability. As all of us know today, clericalism has become uh, a, a very common term in Catholic ethos. Uh, but I think the main point that connects clericalism to non-accountability is this line, namely the clergy to a certain extent, the laity, but more than the laity, the clergy perceiving themselves as a separate group, as an elite group, as a special group, and putting themselves, so to say, on a sort of a pedestal. And then coming to this terrible conclusion, consciously or unconsciously, that they are not accountable to anyone. And uh, I don't think I'm saying it in a lighter vein. I'm a Catholic priest, a Redemptorist priest. It's not spitting on my own face, looking upwards, but facts are facts. The point is this, most of the priests and bishops who are into this clericalistic mentality think that that's the way priestly culture should be. I don't know whether I'm clear on that point. When you perceive wrongly, erroneously, whether invincibly or vincibly, 
that this is the way things should be, that's really difficult. And uh, so I don't know how many of them are accountable, even think that they are accountable even to their immediate superiors. Forget about superiors. The fact that they are shepherds of the flock, they are certainly accountable. Uh, in my article, Chris, as you asked, it's about, I'm trying to say how a distorted interpretation, please mark the words carefully, a distorted interpretation of the virtue of obedience in the Catholic Church, obedient, not only Catholic Church, in the Christian uh, churches, obedience is a virtue. You cannot dispense with that. Obedience, I'm not talking about obedience to superiors, biblical concept of obedience, etc., etc. But how this rich concept of obedience has been misinterpreted to the advantage of those in authority. And in my paper, in that collection of essays of the Peter and Paul seminar, I'm trying to say how in the long run, the separation of the clergy from the lady has contributed, or rather has contributed to enhance the, 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 the non-accountability, the idea of being accountable. It is uh, because they think they are not accountable, simply as that. Uh, yeah, I think... Uh, Yes, and can I um, just follow up by, you know, asking what other you know, aspects of the the current theology of priesthood that um, might be used to support this this clericalism, and what is your what is your view on that? A certain is there a certain, is there a certain theology of the priesthood? That is yeah, that's, that's it. Actually, I want to refer you to, in view of that question, I didn't expect that, uh, but nevertheless, I have the point here. Uh, I had jotted down a point before coming here. There is this book, those who are interested, and then I'm going to talk about it, not just refer you to the book and escape, because uh, George Wilson, a Jesuit, he has written that beautiful book some years ago, Clericalism, The Death of Priesthood. So clericalism and the, 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 the authentic concept of priesthood are not tallying with each other. I often tell, uh, Chris, to my students as well as when I preach retreats as a redemptorist, when I preach, I say, we have to make a very subtle distinction because very often we can confuse things. Clericalism is not just the way a priest ought to behave. Let me put it this way. There's a thing called a genuine priestly culture. A priest has to have a way of life. An ordained priest, an ordained bishop. There's a priestly culture. A priestly identity is gained from that priestly culture. But, 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 that identity of a priest or a bishop, a cleric, should not annihilate the identities of the rest of the people of God. Because the rest of the people of God are also blessed with so many charisms, so many gifts of the Spirit, if we believe in the Scriptures, if we believe in the Christian tradition. So the problem with clericalism is, while we respect that there is a priestly culture, of course, we as priests, we know uh, today that also is an issue. There's some people think that anything goes and there's no priestly identity. But it does not mean under the name of priestly culture, we should use up the roles entrusted to each and every baptized person by the Holy Spirit. Well, and I think this, this is going to come up uh, in a big way uh, in the Synod Assembly. Uh, next month and in 2024 because it's obviously mentioned a lot in the in the working document uh, i'd like to now come to to, to eugene um, eugene duffy who is as i said at the beginning uh, the co-moderator of the peter and paul seminar and uh, has written a fascinating paper about what the church can learn about accountability from 
public bodies and secular organizations where there is often an insistence on separation of powers and supervisory bodies so usually what, what do you see as the main lessons that can be can be learned yeah so thank you thank you uh, christopher and thank you for the addition to again to participate in this uh, webinar i think uh, a colleague of mine um, worked with me on this particular paper and the idea of accountability i think we have first of all i think from a theological point of view we have to acknowledge the fact that the church has its own systems of accountability and its own grounding or accountability in the very nature of the church and so on who's emerging there in the conversations so far but also i think it's very important to acknowledge that the church has a lot to learn from other organizations from other social structures from management theory and so on and i think what we learned from that first of all is to give a definition of accountability which i think is important and the definition of accountability that we used was that it's a formal obligation to submit to a mechanism designed to achieve external scrutiny in explaining or justifying past actions or performance with the possibility of consequences arising. Now that might sound fairly heavy just to, to, to read it that way. But I think you can already see this kind of thing playing out in the church. If you take, for example, the cardinal being tried at the moment in Rome for an issue around mismanagement of finances or an accusation of mismanagement of finances, somebody who is being called to account externally. And I think that's that's something that, that came up very significantly for us, that there has to be external scrutiny, not just the, the ordinary accountability that may go on within an organization in terms of line manager so perhaps uh, somebody in ministry being responsible to the to the parish priest or the parish pastoral council that to the bishop and so on up along the line that's that's one kind of external scrutiny that can exist in the church but there's also need for external organizations because otherwise we end up in a kind of a closed loop reporting system and that can be problematic and we've seen that in examples, I think, maybe from the United States in the McCarrick case, where a lot of uh, problems were identified by people, but the system was kind of a, a, a closed loop. Whereas we need external organizations to um, offer a kind of an evaluation of our performances. And here in the Irish situation, I think in others as well, for example, with regard to the handling of child sexual abuse issues, we now have a national board that's completely independent of the hierarchy that monitors every diocese on a regular basis with regard to their compliance to the best practice and best standards. And I think as well for the church, if it's to be credible in its time and place, it must conform to the standards. So again, we can learn about high standards from other organizations, from, from social systems and so on. I think then when we apply that to the church, you may be at a more local level or at a more practical level. Parishes can ask, for example, have the parish pastoral councils in place? Not all parishes have. Is there a finance council in place? How are child protection policies being managed? How about education programs? Are they in place and how are they resourced? Is there continual personal development for personnel involved and so on. I think there are lots of things that, that, that we can learn that way. The other thing, I, the other major issue I think that emerged for us is that it's not just adequate or enough to change, um, to change structures, to change regulations and procedures within an organization, that unless there's a cultural reform, or form of attitudes, mindsets, beliefs, assumptions, values, ideologies, and so on. Whatever structures you put in place, unless those are changed, unless that cultural reform has occurred, 
then it's very hard to effect the kind of reform that would be desired or to have real accountability in the system. And I think what um, is happening at the moment with regard to the emphasis on synodality, it is about a conversion, a change of mindset in how we are as church. And I think that's what Pope Francis is uh, certainly encouraging, that conversion of mind and attitude and dispositions on the part of all within the church, that that leads to a greater accountability ultimately. So I think they, they're, they're among the, the important things I think that we have, that, that we have learned from uh, Dean Lloyd, uh, a mass consultant in the Irish context, worked with me on, on the paper that I had there in the, yeah. in the studio at Canonica. Um, there's one thing though I would like to go back to, if you don't mind, uh, Christopher, just on uh, what Vima was talking about there in terms of a theology of priesthood, I think, which is also important. That perhaps since the beginning of Pope John Paul's pontificate, there has been an emphasis on the priest as acting in persona Christi, in the name or in the person of Christ. And that can, for some people, when misused, under certain miraculism, because it kind of creates the impression that priest is accountable to God alone, that he's in a direct line from Christ, as it were, without adequately factoring in his relationship to the entire church. And the idea of, of church from Vatican II is much more that of uh, a network of good relationships, of people in right relationship with an, one another and in right relationship with God. So that's on acting in Storma Christi can underpin uh, all kinds of clericalist attitudes and like provide a kind of an almost an ontology to, to justify the priest acting alone without due reference to, to the rest of the parish or those for whom he's responsible. That's just a, a addendum to 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 um, Vima's contribution as yeah. well. I think that's yeah. important. Just one of the things we identified in our in our collection of papers. Sure. Now, it's also true though that when accountability is mentioned, it is often resisted internally um, in the church, and that's something that the synod document, working document, is is saying as well. Um, and you and your paper uh, do a good job in kind of identifying the different tactics and techniques that are employed to resist any kind of accountability. But aren't you worried that 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 the the move to a more accountable synodal church is going to be strongly resisted um, at, at all sorts of levels? And, and what what should be done about that? Well, again, I think for, for a lot, of it, it's going to be a slow process and it, it's, it's a change of culture, a change of mentality, a change of attitude. And in any organisation, that certainly takes, takes time. And I think Miriam touched on something there significantly in, in the opening uh, contribution about churches learning from one another. And that, that's an element of... Uh, accountability and how you engender a sense of accountability, that there's feedback and assessment of what people are doing, that you're learning from, from others, that, that, you're, that you're taking that on board, that there's a reflection. And a word that Pope Francis is using very regularly is, is that word discernment. And I think we have to practice much more discernment and therefore reflective practice if, if we're to engender a deeper sense of, of accountability and again learning from good good practice in, in in other churches and other local churches or other areas of the church for example as as uh, Raphael was giving there from from the Latin American context yeah yeah okay well um I've got a lot of questions coming in as, as I'm sure that's no surprise uh, to learn that and I'm going to go through a few of them now and um whoever wants to answer um volunteer or or i'll put you on the spot um whatever happens quicker um but we've got a question um about the synod process itself and there are rumors that some of the synod discussions are going to be placed under pontifical secrets in the forthcoming assembly um 
is that something you think is going to happen and doesn't that jar with a more well doesn't that contradict a more transparent and accountable church um of course there obviously needs to be confidentiality in some areas of discussions but this idea of the pontifical secret miriam is there something that could happen do you think or yes i i that could happen um i think that what the pope is from from what i get uh, what a concern of the pope is um that the people will participate in this process this is not and he has said this time and again this is not a parliament so the people are invited to go first in a retreat and then they are invited to discern together a process and somebody was saying to me the other day it's a little bit like if you go for a 30-day retreat with the Jesuits, um, an Ignatian retreat, you don't report in the middle where you are at. So it gives the, an, another aspect that is important is that the people come as an I, and Fimal referred to Erdre already to our Frascati meeting. Um, I think um, a number of us have been participating in the continental meetings. And, and we discovered a process occurs. So as you are in the middle of that process, you are listening, something is happening in, that transforms you. And I think there should be the space indeed for people to, um, to, to come to, from an I to a we. And so I think it will be important how we can, uh, how the whole group who is gathered in that synod can enter into that process. I personally, again, as a kind of lawyer, I don't like the term pontifical secret. Mm. Um, the word secret in English is, is secrecy, and that is something also from the abuse cases. We don't like secrecy. I don't like secrecy. I like confidentiality, because I think there, too, we can see that there should be room where people can freely speak and where it is not reported afterwards, guess what bishop so-and-so said, or um, I, I think that's not helpful. Also, some members of that um, synodal process could be extremely active on all kinds of social media and other voices could then be lost um, in the social media. So there could be um, a, a picture as if there was only one perspective on all of this. So I, I think this, these are factors to be considered. At the same time, Peter and Paul Seminar, we, have, we are working on the basis of Vatican II, um we are studying you know the reception of the council i think it will be a major challenge if this synod meets how do you bring so this is what we know from vatican II. the bishop underwent a conversion and then they got home and the question was then how can they bring on board the rest of the people and this i think is going to be a challenge how shall we do that so that then everybody is part of that process and uh, some people say, my bishop, my diocese has not really participated. It's never too late to, to begin. It's never too late to enter into this train. And I think the process, we should not just look from what's coming from Rome, but also already begin implementing things. Uh, and I'm very relaxed about that as a canon lawyer. Begin implementing already some of the, the, the things that we have discovered. We have the example of Raphael. I, I like to always give this one example um, can a law is saying there are diocesan pastoral councils. Um, they are, if circumstances recommend, uh, um, the bishop can have them. The bishop must then have for, therefore exercise a discernment process. If he believes in the sacrament of confirmation, if he goes every Sunday to, 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 to celebrate this sacrament, should he not believe in the working of the Holy Spirit in his own diocese? And should he then not ask the people to contribute from their um, talents and their um, gifts that they have received. Now, in order to have a diocesan pastoral council, the bishop must make statutes. Nothing is impeding a bishop, no canon law, from writing in the statutes that, for example, 30, 40, 50 percent of the members should be women, should be a certain number of migrants. So the bishop could do that today. And he doesn't have to wait for a change in canon law. He doesn't have to wait for, um, for a synod to take place this year and next year. This is already possible under canon law, and there is nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It would be an appreciation of what we are already doing. So don't just sit and wait, but the whole community 
can begin and practice this and learn to listen to the others. Yeah, um, there's a, there's some questions here about um, clericalism and about whether this is starting in the seminaries and to what extent can seminary formation uh, deal with this? Um, perhaps Vimal or, or Raphael Eugene would like to answer um, on this point. Um, and there's obviously something that comes up in the Synod working document. Uh, one thing I, and connecting with I, Miriam. I may uh, not claim that uh, I have. Vimal then, Raphael. Yeah, Vimal. I'm oh, sorry. Is it Raphael who speaks? Sorry, yeah. sorry, I didn't hear. No, no, don't Raphael, worry. Now, I'm just connecting one thing with Miriam that she says something very important that there are things that can be already implemented. Uh, I think there is a trilogy that if we do not reform it, we will not advance, which is the theology of the priesthood, the seminaries, and the parishes. If you don't touch that trilogy, uh, you would not have a how to move forward in a synodal church. And in Spanish, we differentiate a priest by saying sacer sacerdote, sacerdos, the sacredness, and presbyter, which in English, it doesn't work. But the difference is important because when we're talking about the reform of the theology of the priesthood is desacralization of the priest. So this is one aspect that can be already done in the pensa of the seminaries uh, and also the way they uh, live in a seminary. Because then you have the parishes where you exercise the ministry. So if you don't uh, reform that institution, it will never again have, be happening in this old you know, church. And then finally, you need to reform these three together, together. You cannot do one and then the other one. And I think the Council of Trent was effective because it did these three uh, pillars and worked it out so it could be a reform that then could be implemented in the whole uh, global church. So that's the challenge today uh, that I think that I'm seeing and it comes all over the reports. No? Yeah. Did Vimal, I know Eugene's got his hand up. Vimal, did you want to, to come in now? Yeah, uh, about the question you raised uh, Chris, regarding seminary training and clericalism. I myself am a seminary teacher as well, in addition to my teaching in Rome. Uh, I have just two points to make here. Uh, number one is, in the seminaries, there is a serious need today to stress on the servant priesthood. Servant priesthood. It's there in theory. It's there in theory. For example, uh, the Last Supper scene, uh, then when Jesus uh, is asked by the mother of the two uh, brothers, sons of Zebedee, uh, this is not the way it should be, etc. Et These are all taught. But I think there needs to be an emphasis on servant priesthood in seminaries, number one. The other side of the same coin is my second point. Namely, uh, there is a need to insist on the dignity of all the baptized. That all the baptized have different roles to play in the church. Personally, I feel, among many other things that need to be done, if these two major things are done, it will be something for seminary formation. Namely, servant priesthood should be stressed. Secondly, the dignity. Dignity is not just an abstract concept. Dignity that is given by the Holy Spirit through various gifts and charisms. And there should be a teamwork in the church, not just priest is to do everything, as clericalism seems to presume. Okay. And the, you, Eugene, did you want to come in? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that the issue of seminary formation has come up quite uh, consistently across the board in the feedback in, for, for the Synod. And I think one of the issues I think needs to be addressed is the very physical experience of, of seminary. A monastic kind of formation for diocesan priests, I don't think is any longer adequate or appropriate because most priests are going to be living on their own, they're going to be living in the midst of communities. And I think moving 
seminarians out of the seminary for most of their formation would be a good start. That, that's number one, where they're actually living and working in parishes and experiencing parishes and team ministry and so on from, from the word go. Secondly, I think the way we teach theology in the seminary also needs a serious review. We still teach theology in a very academic uh, register, if you like. And I think we could learn a lot from something like medicine. There's much greater interaction between the practicum and the theory. And the kind of theology that we teach in the seminaries far too often is too abstract. And I think seminarians need to be facilitated in learning how to apply that theology, how to work with it in a way that enriches the lives of people, that enriches their own preaching, that can help people in their own spiritual journeys and so on. So I think there will be two things. I would agree with what the others have said as well. Yeah, uh, we've got Sister Jill Golding, um, who would like to come in, um, who is, I think, be well known to the panel and others. Um, Jill, can you? Uh... Thank, uh, thanks, Christopher. Um, I agree with a lot, most all that's been said since I got it came in. I'm afraid I was late entering into this, unfortunately. My concern concern is in the in work that I've been doing with um, seminarians, seminary form, uh, formations, etc., is that we have to get the seminary formators on board. We can do what we want in seminaries, as it were, and it can be dissipated because there's not the backing of the seminary formators. So I think that is something that needs to be seriously addressed as a priority in terms of how we're moving forward. Um, then if the seminary formators are part and parcel of this, then the seminarians themselves will also have that backing to, as it were, ongoingly think in terms of the direction that Vima was talking about in terms of uh, uh, servant leadership and whole direction of engagement in terms of the wider community. One of the questions I often find myself asking those coming up for ordination is, how are you going to dispose yourself to learn from the people of God how to be a good priest? And 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 have you have you have you um, seen the resistance amongst formators though to to what we're talking about? I think that I think in some quarters it, there's resistance, but I think it's uh, often more resistance through not understanding what the synodal process is um, and having, as it were, sound bites from various polarised scenarios that don't assist. Um, and I think that's, uh, for example, in certain dioceses because it wasn't taken up uh, really well, um, if at all. And in other situations, because the exposure to what it's been about, uh, the, the, the general thrust of the exposure to what it's been about has not been uh, a very positive experience for them. What they have taken up is a lot from social media that has been, um, well, as you know yourself, any kind of kind of consultation on social media, there's been a very polarized reality there. Yeah. Okay, thank thank you. Um, now we're coming to the end of our time, but I would just like to take one last question from from the chat from Mark Williams, who, uh, as an abuse survivor, asks about um, how accountability can foster healing for victims and survivors, and many others, um, more than just listening, but how the church at this synodal moment um, can foster healing. Uh, from those who have suffered uh, and, and Mark has who I know is um, worked closely with Cardinal Tobin in the Archdiocese of Newark so um, I don't know who would like to take that perhaps Miriam would like to take that question yeah I think uh, I was uh, 2018 to 2022 on the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors and I think that listening is important for victims it's extremely important but um, another aspect is justice. And um, so the accountability then translates into providing justice. And there too, um, we as Pontifical Commission, we issued two um, 
publications. In one of them, actually, Fimal was uh, quite involved. It was about uh, the seal of confession and it was about transparency and um, how can we um, also balance with the confidentiality that victims also need confidentiality with regard to their story. They have to decide what will be made public about their story. So we can't just put everything out there. Um, but I think the, the issue of a call for justice is extremely important. And um, earlier this year, I was able to publish a book um, together with Archbishop Charles Chikluna, who is, uh, you know, as we all know, a, a major person in the child sexual abuse um, allegations. Um, and it has the title, The Rights of Victims in Penal Procedures. So we are there too, looking into not only what are the rights of the accused or what should the bishops do, but all of this has to be, what are the rights of the accused? What are the rights of the victims? And again, like we have with what um, Eugene was presenting, we, we ask there too, what can we learn from the world? So we ask there too, what can the church learn from international treaties that are already there? What can we learn? And we took 10 countries in the world to ask how in your legal system, do you actually see to the rights of victims what, what, what is being implemented there and what could the church learn from these different um, countries? It was a most remarkable conference. And um, as I said, the papers have been published. They're free of access. Um, I was delighted to find a sponsor to um, make this book available to every victim in the world at no cost. So if you Google my name, Archbishop Shikluna, Rights of Victims, you will find it in English and you can access all the articles. So I'll try and put that in the chat um, uh, now um, so that people can, can see it. Um, we are now at the end of the time. Um, so thank you. I'd like to thank all our panel for everything. And I'm also going to... Uh, highlight well there's a number of books here Miriam so perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll highlight the book that Miriam has just handed up put up there which is a book that's been written with Vimal um, Tirmana another of our panelists um, I'm going to put that in the chat now um, the people of God has spoken which is looking at the uh, uh, the continental assemblies that took place um, during the synod process um, so there's a there's a a wealth of literature out there for anyone interested in in, in all of this. Um, it doesn't just have to be that book about Pandora's box um, uh, that's been uh, put out recently. Um, this is this is much more serious material, um, and it's now in the uh, it's now in the chat. I can see. So I just like to thank um, everyone who took part in this uh, call and this in this webinar. Um, to thank Miriam, Eugene, Vimal and Raphael for sharing your expertise and your insights and um, watch this space. The Synod, the synod is really beginning to, to hot up. So uh, and also um, please follow the tablets uh, reporting. I'll be reporting the Synod as closely as, as possible and in various different ways. So um, do follow the tablet online and in print to uh, get the latest information about